right, amen. Can we hear me? Yep. I am on. So yes, you're not getting the typical bald-headed speaker, but I am the substitute. We'll take it. And it's funny because I was thinking here, now that the campus is back, can you hear me? Is this on? Okay, good. I was thinking, you know, where was I exactly 30 years ago today? I was a senior in high school. I was not a Christian. But after some teenage stupidity that I did, it kind of got me in the hospital with the surgery. It made me rethink life. And so at that moment, I'm like, what is the most righteous decision that I can make at this time? And it was to go to UMass. And that's where it changed everything. I, I, I met God. My life was confined. It was, it was fantastic. So it's just a different experience having the, the campus here with us. So I'm, I'm grateful you're back. And if you haven't been with us, over this month of January, we've been studying out the book of Jonah. You know, the first week it was entitled The Running Man, Jonah Running Away from God. The second week we looked at The Sinking Man. We find Jonah had some issues. So this week I felt like the peer pressure of staying in form, so I'm calling it The Repenting Man. So we shall see. But since I know the campus wasn't here, and maybe you haven't been here the last two weeks, I'll give you the 30-second recap, all right? So here we had Jonah. God says, Jonah, I want you to go. Jonah says no. He gets on a ship and sails in the opposite direction. God pursues him. He comes in a storm. And the crew of this ship is freaking out. And they're like, what are we doing? They start calling on their own gods. Finally, like, where's Jonah? He's sleeping. They wake him up. Jonah, what is your issue? What is your problem? Call on your God. And then they're like, Who, someone must have caused this calamity to come upon us. Let's cast lots. They cast lots. Guess who it falls on? Jonah. Jonah's like, yep, my bad. I got issues. I'm running from God. So they're like, well, what are we going to do? You know, and they, Jonah's like, you know what? Chuck me overboard. They're like, we can't chuck you overboard. Let's try and row back. They start rowing. It gets worse. They're like, maybe we can chuck you overboard. <laughs> They're like, Jonah's God, please don't harm us for chucking him overboard. And they throw him overboard. And, of course, a huge fish comes, swallows Jonah up. And that's where he kind of has a rock-bottom moment. He's like, God, I'm sorry. I'm a mess. I I disobeyed. And then, in probably one of the the greatest examples of projectile vomiting ever, (laughs) the fish spits Jonah up on the land. And so that's where we are here in Chapter 3. We're going to read through... Chapter 3. So Jonah chapter 3, 10 verses. The Bible reads. It says, Then the the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, Forty more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believe God. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. Do not let people or animals or herds or flocks taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let the people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent with compassion, turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. You ever read the Bible? And you're like, I know. (laughs) Bear with me. You read the Bible and you're like, okay, that was too much information. Kind of like if you're going through Leviticus and the law or like pages of genealogy. Like, ugh. You know, or, you know, maybe it's just right. I mean, for me, I'm twisted. So I like, I think of when Jesus talks about a demon possessed man. You know, it's like, hey, Here's this guy, broken shackles and chains around him. He's screaming. He's running naked through the tombs. He's crying out, and he's cutting himself with rocks. Like, okay, that's a good visual. I I understand that. I get that. And other times, you're just kind of left wanting a bit. You're like, can you give me more information? And so really, as we go through Jonah 3, I'm hoping that this is going to be just enough for you. 
And there's an objective I have this morning. And really, the, the objective this morning is to examine the repentance of Jonah, of the Ninevites, and ourselves, and hopefully to explain, like, how can we have a lasting repentance? How can we ensure a lasting change? And since we're talking about repentance, we should define that. So repentance really is, it's recognizing that there's something before you in your life, and you're like, this is not good. This is harming myself. It's harming others. So it's a complete turning. You're walking this way, and you're like, whoop, i got to go the opposite direction. Why? Because I don't want to continue. It's if you're on a bridge, and the bridge is out a mile ahead, and you're going, it, anything but a complete 180 turnaround, if it's just a little repentance, if it's half heart, you're going off the bridge. You're cooked, right? So repentance, why do we do that? Because we want a full life. We want real life. And God's like, I, I promise you a real full life if you can really repent. So we don't want a half-hearted repentance because it'll just end up continuing to hurt you and those around you. So here's Jonah. He gets his second chance. He's like, God, I, I didn't listen. And he goes. He repents of his disobedience. And he's off to the city of Nineveh. So Nineveh, I mean, Nineveh was, a great, it was the greatest city of its time. It was an impressive city. I mean, it was the center of economic might, military might, you know, cultural might. It was a huge city. Try and envision. I mean, it had 100-foot walls surrounding it, super thick. You could, you could drive three chariots side by side on top of these walls. Just impressive. The problem is these people, these people were a, they were a violent uh, people. You know, they were a, dare I say, you know, perverted uh, people. So we, we look at this, and, and their object of worship really was Ishtar. Ishtar was a goddess of war and sensual indulgence. So it's a little in intimidating. You've got this perverted, vile people, and you're going into this city. There's a whole lot of nasty going on. And it wouldn't exactly be my number one choice for a missionary trip. Okay? But it just shows us, you know, God's like, this city is important to me. And what God sees and what we can see can be two different things. I can see filth and hopelessness. And God can be like, well, no, I see sons and daughters. So Jonah's on his way. He's going through the city, and God's like, I'm going to give you a message, you know, short and sweet. He says, 40 more days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. I mean, imagine, right? I mean, we just had this great singing and communion, and I come up, oh, here's Dan Maroney, yay. I get up here, hey, church, 40 days, you're all toast. Have a great afternoon. Get your kids. Maybe fill out a response card. I mean, that's just, that would be super uncomfortable for you and me. I mean, that would just be flat out awkward. Yet in the first week, you know, um, I should say this. My guess, though, with Nineveh from past lessons, I think Nineveh was actually, yeah, Nineveh, Jonah. I think Jonah was fired up when he heard that message because we know that the way he felt about these Ninevites, they were repulsive to him. We know that they were probably responsible for killing his own father. And he's like, I get this sweet fire and brimstone message. Oh, I'm bringing it. Here I go. And so I think of this, because Sajin asked us to identify in the first week, what are Nineveh's for us? What are the things that just confront our character? It's a struggle. We've got to face them. Of course, it, may, it could be any number of things. I tend to think of it as people. So I was thinking of some examples. This must sound crazy, but I don't know if you're in a neighborhood. There's a lot of people. I, I live in a, a city. It, there's like just almost as many dogs as people. <laughs> so I'll refer to it as like dog walker guy. And the dog, you know, faithful, walking the dog every, every day, walking through. And for whatever reason, dog walker guy's dog seems to have a magnetic pull. Its digestive system has a magnetic pull to my front lawn. <laughs> and you're just like, are you like, you just want to go out, dog walker guy! 40 days! Poopy no more! <laughs> Get it out! And you know, maybe it's you. Maybe it's the, the person who just loves to gossip or just always just rides you, lets you have it. You know, you just like 40 days and. Ugh. For me, we have two teenage daughters, so we go to a lot of high school sporting events. And sometimes, like, there's fans there. And this isn't like WNBA, this isn't professional refs. So sometimes they get a little obnoxious with what they're doing. And so we were at this game, this one parent, and I, I, was, I had Jonah going on in my brain, because 
I mean, she was using the Lord's name. It wasn't in praise. All right. And then it's as if she was a European soccer commentator. Literally, she was so frustrated by the team, the, the, the way they were playing. She literally, this is no exaggeration. She's like, rebound! And I'm like, oh, you're just like, what just happened? I, I literally, you want to turn around and go, oh, yeah? 40 days! Overthrown! You know, I mean, that's, that's where my mind going. I'm messed up. So, but you look at that message, 40 days and you'll be overthrown. You know, there's an interesting word in there. You know, the Hebrew word for overthrown is havak. H-A-P-A-K. Havak. And the Hebrew ear would hear this word and they would know that there's two distinct meanings to the word havak. When Jonah said that Nineveh would be overturned, no doubt, in his mind, he meant overturned in the same way as Sodom and Gomorrah. The word havak is used in Genesis 19.25 referring to those cities. And we know what the result there. They were toasted, right? So here's Jonah. He's all excited going into the heart, you know, of his enemies and saying, you're going to get it. God is going to get you. However, there's another meaning to the word, havak. That word is, you can, you can find it in Hosea 11.8 and other places, but it's used to describe the change in the Lord's heart. Okay, and so this seems to be incredible irony in our, in, in our story because Jonah walked into Nineveh hoping that God was going to havak, destroy the city, but what ultimately happened was Nineveh, havak, changed. And you notice what happened after this, you know, super short and sweet sermon Jonah gave to the people of Nineveh. It says the Ninevites believed God. I mean, the king proclaimed a fast. I, this is... He says, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them drink. What the heck does that look like? Do you just look at herds of sheep or goats and say, hey, no grass for you. Like, <laughs> and, then they, and then they play dress up, right? They, they clothe them in sackcloth. And, and he's, he's begging everybody, call out urgently on God. Let them know. You know let, let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? Maybe God will relent and with compassion turn. And Jonah, this is not what Jonah expected. I don't think this is what he was hoping for. I mean, this is a radical event. This is the greatest revival recorded in the Bible. And Jonah is ticked off. He has a hissy fit. Well, that's a preview for chapter 4. We'll get there next week. You know, so you're like, well, gosh, Jonah, what did you repent of? You know, he repented of his disobedience. You know, God said go, and he went. But as far as his, his prejudice, his hatred... His selfishness, not so much. His repentance wasn't complete. It was a little half-hearted. It's the equivalent of us coming to church and say, hey, attendance, check. You know, contribution, check. I pray a little bit. I'm a good guy. But we're not dealing with the Ninevehs. Not dealing with the deeper things in our character. It's where God's a part of your life, but he's not the source of your life. He's not the center of your life. There's other things that are coming before him. We refer to those as idols. And those idols are winning out. It means you're still on the throne. And it's ultimately your will that's prevailing and not his. And we all have those. I have them. I think even just from studying Jonah, we were coming to the church building about four weeks ago. There was a small group leader training, so I catch myself now. We're driving, and, and spouses, I don't know if you ever noticed this of your partner. We're driving in the car, and I'm just sitting there like, my, my lips are moving, but nothing's coming out. I'm talking to myself. My wife looks at me. It's like, what are you thinking? You know, and I'm like, oh, I'm busted. And I'm like, I go, I'm looking at her, and I'm like, I'm Jonah. It's like I'm driving to this training. I'm like, I don't want to go. I'm thinking of all these other things I want to do on my Saturday morning. And, she's, and I'm like, I'm, I'm half-hearted. You know, of course, we go, and the training is fantastic. It's inspirational. I'm like, yeah, I'm an idiot. I should have been wanting to go all along. But this is... This is the constant battle I think we all face because hypocrisy is real. Yeah. You know, we can't just talk the talk. We want to walk the walk, right? Yep. Yep. So how about the Ninevites? We saw Jonah, but the Ninevites, I mean, my goodness, what a reaction. The only thing I can think about or equate it to is if, you know, the president goes before, you know, Congress in the State of the Union address and some guy walks in and just, 40 days, you're all going to be overthrown. And all of a sudden they just 
fall down and declare like a national, you know, revival of, you know, moral revival, spiritual revival, and they just all are like, I'm changing. I just, I, I mean, that's really, because you look at, look at the king. The king is, he hears it, and he, in verse 6 he says, when Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. That's a, a radical act of seriousness. By taking off his royal robes, he's demonstrating an act of submission. And covering him with sackcloth, he's asked for repentance. And then he sat in the dust, which symbolize, symbolizes hopelessness. And this is the attitude God wanted to see from the heart of Jonah, but instead it came in a pagan king. And this is where I want more. This is my God, can you give me another 10 verses and more clearly show me? Because I'm like, what clicked in their heart and mind that it produced this type of reaction? So it, the Bible doesn't tell us, but here's what I'd like to think. You know, first, you think of these events. I imagine, I mean, certainly not as quickly, but word traveled, okay? When there's events and things, word travels. It does today. It just happens instantaneously. There, it takes a little while. But you think about it, there are these people, these, the, the sailors witnessed this storm. They watched, you know, their gods failed. Jonah's God calmed the storm. It's like, I'm trading gods. I think they probably talked about that. You know, and you can imagine, I wonder when the storm was calm and the fish came up and grabbed Jonah, I'm like, I wonder if they saw it. You know, and of course I have my Hollywood, you know, depiction of what that may look out. So Ryan, go ahead and show. I, I, I have a slide here that it's what I would like to believe. <laughs> Now, I don't think Jonah was a surfer, and I know Sajin isn't, but, you know, I don't know what it looked like, but it's pretty impressive. We better, okay, get that off. <laughs> but it had to be impressive. It had to be memorable. If you saw that, that, that doesn't go out of your mind. You talk about that. That, that is going to spread, and forget about it. What if there was a witness to the discharge, right? Can you imagine that all of a sudden? Bleh! You know, it's just like... Oh, the stink isn't coming off, but I'm going to Nineveh. If someone saw that, I mean, you'd be talking about this. You'd be like, this is the guy. This, that's the guy that survived the fish. You know, Nineveh means house of the fish. You know, I, th th they were probably aware that this crazy creature in there, and no, no, he overcame it. That, that would strike some fear into me. So maybe that's it. You know, or maybe it was just, you know, their lifestyle caught up with them. Because, again, what did they do? They killed. They conquered. You know, they build, they withheld, no pleasure of the flesh. I mean, how long will you, before you get to that point, you just say, enough. I'm tired of this. I'm tired of the pressure. I'm tired of the expectation. It's like today, right? I mean, how much, how much status, how much wealth, how much sex, how much partying, how much focus on self can you, can you have? Because we all re see the news, right? I mean, death, divorce, depression. Family's dysfunction, suicide, it shows no favoritism amongst the social classes, right? Mm -hmm. right? Maybe their hearts were just ready for a change. Maybe the message was just exactly what they needed. But how do we know it was true? How do we know they actually really repented? Turn with me over to Matthew 12. Mm -hmm. Matthew 12, we're going to be looking at verses 38 to 41. Verse 38, it says, Then some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law said to him, Teacher, we want a sign from you. He answered, A wicked, adulterous generation asks for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be the three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will stand up at judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and now something greater than Jonah is here. How do we know it's true? Jesus confirms it. He confirms it. And not only that, he says, you know, they're going to stand up and judge you because someone far greater is before you, and you're missing it. Speaking to the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, he's like, the, the same pain, the same cruelty and horror that was inflicted by the Ninevites on their enemies, it's going to be inflicted on me. I'm taking the penalty of your sin. I'm going to die. I'm going in the earth three days, but I'm going to overcome. 
I'm going to rise again, and you're missing it. Jesus kept telling these people, you're missing it. And this is the gospel message. This is the message we preach every Sunday. This is why we worship. Ryan did a great job sharing it in communion. It's, it's like when we, we hear Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It doesn't matter if you're a Jew, a Gentile, a Pharisee, a Ninevite, from Chicopee or Springfield. You know, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood. Why? Because our sin had separated us. There was only one worthy sacrifice. It was Jesus. He's like, I'll do it. It's like, God, I want them to share in the relationship I have with my Father. This is the only way to make the unholy holy. So God heard the Ninevites' prayer. He heard in verse 10, this is what he said. Back in Jonah 3, he says, When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. And you could add deserve. So maybe you're like me, maybe you're curious, or maybe you're cynical. You know what the first place my mind went after I, I finished reading that? My mind was like, okay, so how long did they repent for? Did it last? Did they stay committed to God? We don't know exactly, but from the time, because we found that Nineveh, actually, ultimately, it does get destroyed. Another prophet came and preached, and it was destroyed. It was about roughly 150 years from the time Jonah came till the city was destroyed. About five generations. How long did they repent for? Was it one generation? Two? Three? I don't know. I do know this, though. How did it happen? It happened one decision at a time, one lack of conviction at a time, one individual at a time, and before, before you knew it, they returned to their old wicked ways. Wow. That's scary. Isn't that scary? Like, I don't, I don't want that to happen to us. Mm -hmm. I want it to happen to me and my family. Mm -hmm. So I think the question is, you know, how do we ensure that we have this enduring repentance? Mm -hmm. And there's three things I want to quickly share that I think can help protect the state of our hearts. Because this is the biggest challenge I think the church and Christianity faces today. You know, we're, we're all about the message we preach, right? But it's got to be the message we live. Right. Here are three things I think can help. The first is prayer. Absolutely prayer. I think it's impossible to be a Christian and not pray. There was an old uh, commentary quote. It said, prayer without reformation is a mockery of God. It must precede true repentance. What's that saying? It's saying, how can you possibly be in the state of mind that you need to be to go before God, recognizing who he is, who you are, and it's like preaching the gospel to yourself. Mm -hmm. Prayer is, it's praising God. It's thanking God. It's petitioning God. It's recognizing God I'm a mess, you know. I, I need to be controlled by your promises, not my own impressions. Because I know how I can think of myself. I need to be reminded of how you think of me. Please give me wisdom. It's where you beg God for wisdom, for understanding, for insight, to seek his face, to know him. This is prayer. We've got to be praying people. It helps protect us from the idols. Amen? Amen. Number two, one another relationships. Stronger together, right? That's our theme. Stronger together. We engage with one another. Why? We need it. We need encouragement. We lovingly confront each other because we have blind spots. You know, we can post things on Facebook and you can be like, oh, well, where's that brother's heart at? Great. Well, let's talk about it. You know? Or maybe it's reminding one another of the promises of God because we can, we, we can easily go off the grid. Again, it's just... One another relationships where you're, you're, you're brutally honest. Aren't you afraid of what people think of you? But to have the freedom of being completely brutally honest, asking for advice. I know I'm twisted. I know I can think about money this way. I know I can think about my health, my time this way. Bro, what do you think about this? Brutally honest. God knows us anyway. What freedom comes when we're brutally honest with one another? Third reason, we've got to be mission-minded. Mission minded. You know, we've got to bring this message to others. I know recently there was a challenge, both within these walls and outside of these walls, because we've got a lot of kids. We've got a lot of teens, preteens, right? I know there was a challenge recently of, hey, we need more men in the children's class. We need more men lead teachers. And if you're a dad, I hope you hear that. And if you're a college student, you know what? For whatever reason, you have some unique gift where kids just look at you and they're like, they're awesome. They're just attracted to you. I would encourage you, challenge the levels of your discomfort 
and give yourself to the kids, it'll change you. It will change you. You know, the Bible says the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. That confronts me because I like to be comfortable. You know, we, we can't, I, I can try to overthink it, or, you know, over technique it. But then I'm like, gosh, look at Jonah's message. I can do better than that. 40 days. It's like, no, I can share about who God is, what he's done in my life. And, and here's the encouraging thing. Did you know that you have the perfect resume to be mission minded? How many people here feel like they have ever suffered? <laughs> Mentally, physically, emotionally? Yep. Great. How about this? Have you ever failed at something? Oh, yeah. Anything. Yeah. I failed at something. Now, how many of you have failed at something and suffered? Oh. <laughs> perfect. It's perfect. I mean, it just makes you super useful. Why? Because everybody, because you understand brokenness. You understand weakness. You understand fear. And I promise you, helping someone else to know God is the most fulfilling thing you will do. You know, we've been spending, I don't know how many months it's been, but my, myself and a couple guys, every 6.30 a.m., every Thursday morning, we're at Panera. It's great. We're talking about God. We're looking at the scriptures. We're talking about our lives. It's just, it's the highlight of my week. It's encouraging. I mean, this is what we're supposed to do. Because I wonder... What if Jonah, what if Jonah fully repented and he stayed in the city of Nineveh? What if he loved them? What if he trained them? What if they went to other cities, other nations? What would that story look like? Wouldn't that maybe have a different ending? So this morning we're looking at, we looked at Jonah. We looked at the Ninevites. We heard Jesus' words to the Pharisees. And whether this is like the first church service or the been here for 30 years, Here's what I would say to you, is there's something beautiful, beautiful before you. The gospel message is beautiful. It's before you. I would say don't miss it. Don't half-heart it. Don't claim it only to then dismiss it. Claim it over and over and over again. How do you do that? Enduring through prayer. Enduring through one another relationships and sharing it with others. Amen? Amen, church. Thank you. Amen. Appreciate that. So uh, let's stand. We're going to sing, uh, close out singing about our response to that gospel message, that beautiful message that Dan uh, reminded us of. Oh, happy day. Oh, classic. <laughs>